Shadia, you're muted. I am muted. Thank you. Thank you, Sadia. All right. Assalamu alaikum, everybody. Welcome back to Muslim Spaces Ramadan Halakha. Again, we are joined by Dr. Shanaz Hakani, a professor, associate professor, assistant professor, associate professor at Mercer University, specializing in Islam with a specific focus on gender and sexuality. Um, I don't want to take up too much time, so I'm going to go ahead and pass it on over to uh, Dr. Shanaz and let her take it from there. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Thank you so much for inviting me to join again. And thank you all to those of you who are listening, who are here to join us today. I appreciate um, this opportunity. So last week, I spoke about the compassionate nature of God, and I suggested that we reconsider our fear-based approach to Islam and yeah. instead begin emphasizing God's compassion, a more compassionate approach to Islam. And I didn't mention this last time because it didn't occur to me then but I, I'm, a, I'm, a, uh, I'm very interested in psychology and mental wellness. And um, I want to also point out that fear traumatizes the human mind and body and such an approach to Islam, a fear-based approach to Islam, uh, to worship, to understanding God can have a, a very terrible impact um, on our physical health in the long run and definitely also our mental health in the long and short runs. Um, so it's a it's a very heavy weight to carry, uh, doing things out of fear, uh, panicking when we sin, when we commit a wrong, hating ourselves, hating other people when they or when we do something wrong, um, when we do something that we were taught is unacceptable. And so I want us to just keep that in mind as we uh, think about our own personal approaches to, to God and to Islam. Today, I'm going to continue that conversation on compassion uh, but extend the idea of God's compassion for us to pick and choose, to, to change, to evolve, to renegotiate with Islam so that we can make sense of it uh, better and apply it better to our individual, personal, personalized, customized lives and circumstances. You've, you've probably heard of the report, uh, some say it's a hadith, but it's not quite a hadith, uh, where the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam uh, states that disagreements among my companions is a mercy for you, uh, or another of its, I think it's more popular version is disagreement among disagreements among my ummah is a mercy from God. This report is considered weak, uh, but Muslim scholars have never had a problem referring to or referencing a weak hadith in order to make a point. So I'm going to do the same thing here. It is God's way of showing us mercy that we live in times in especially the 21st century with so much disagreement, with so many different possibilities available to us, with so with the dive with the with a very wide, diverse range of opinions on pretty much anything when it comes to Islam. Um, in my forthcoming book, which is titled Feminism, Tradition and Change in Contemporary Islam, Negotiating Islamic Law and Gender, it's coming out in October, inshallah, with One World um, Publishers. I explore this question of change and tradition, of how Muslims decide what can change with time, what is absolutely not open to change, and, and what is. Now, part of my impetus for why I even pursued that question as my re primary research question for my book was that I kept seeing a pattern in the way that we talk about, uh, about change. It, it seems to me, and it still seems to me this way, but after some research, it's a little bit more complicated. There's a lot more nuance. It seems to me that gender and sexuality related issues are just too often treated as not open to change, but whatever, but everything else is, is changing uh, and everything else can change and that's okay. It's almost as if it, if it's not patriarchal, if it's not misogynistic, is it even Islam? Like as if patriarchy is the backbone uh, of Islam, it's the, the root of Islam. And there, you can read more about it in my book when it comes out, inshallah, but uh, that is a very prominent idea among the scholars that I that I surveyed and other opinions that I looked at. If something was patriarchal, it needed to stay in, in Islam. So I wrote a whole book on this topic. And for my research, I asked Muslims about their personal opinions, as well as what they believe Islam says about five different topics. And those five different topics are child marriage, sexual slavery, uh, female inheritance, women's marriage to non-Muslims, and female-led mixed gender prayer. And I would talk to them about these topics. I would ask them what they personally thought, what they believed Islam said, if they knew anything about it from an Islamic perspective. 
Um, and I would ask them this final question at the end of our conversation. And that question was, what do you think is the impetus for change in Islam? What do you think the factors of change are in Islam? Meaning how do we decide if change is open, if something in Islam is open to change? And they gave me all kinds of very wonderful answers, very constructive answers, very thoughtful answers. People are really thinking about this. The most common one being, you know, when context and social norms change, then we should as well. Then our positions, Islamic position should also, also change. And who makes that change? Well, Islamic scholars should come together and change an existing position if it is not already in line with current social norms. But there was one person that I interviewed who in particular said something that I thought was very powerful and very striking. She said, and I'm quoting her, I want to say social norms, but is that really good enough? As a society, as a Muslim, is that really a good enough impetus for change where we're following the example of a society that we live in? Shouldn't we be questioning our ethics and, and morals and setting precedent for setting precedents for others? Why should slavery be wrong just because it's illegal in the US as in we should have already illegalized slavery a long time ago? I'm so sorry. I feel like my, can you guys hear my dogs? Are we good? Okay. Um, and then she paused for a few moments and, and she said, and she continued and she said, scholars aren't asking these kinds of questions. I don't know what to say. I think we should all be asking ourselves that question. Should we as Muslims really only be allowing or disallowing things after they, after everyone else has reflected on them? I mean, are we just saying no to child marriage or to slavery today? just because it would make Muslims and Islam look really bad or backwards if we didn't, end quote. So this response deeply resonated with me. When Muslims explain that slavery and child marriage, two of the topics that I covered for my research are unacceptable because times have changed, quote unquote, or quote unquote, context has changed. What is this context that they're talking about? What is this context they're imagining? And why are changes relating to how we view gender and sexuality not considered to be relevant socio-cultural contexts as well? Will Muslim women be allowed to lead mixed gender communal prayers and marry men of their choice from other faiths only when Muslims universally think that the rest of the world views Islam as backwards because of these restrictions on women? Will interfaith marriage and female-led prayers, two of the other topics for my research, become acceptable for today's Muslims only if followers of all other religions permit them first. Uh, but the, but the, of course, fun fact here, sub, uh, some religious communities, some subgroups of within several world religions um, have to varying degrees accepted female-led prayers and women's interfaith marriage, women's marriage outside of their religious communities. So how useful then is it, is the idea that social norms have changed is only applicable for child marriage and for slavery. What might a change in context look like in order for Muslims to predominantly, to globally accept something like female-led prayers or women's interfaith marriage as Islamically acceptable? The topic for today's, today's conversation isn't female-led prayers or child marriage, et cetera, but it is this question of how we, how we conceptualize change and how we explain when something can change with time. Dr. Amina Wadud has also brilliantly pointed out and argued in some of her works that when we talk about change and Islam, we tend to forget that the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, was a model of change. He initiated change. He didn't wait for other people around him to change things and then join them. He And, and Muslims, we, we pride ourselves with his work on women's rights, with his work on the rights of poor people, on, of enslaved people, of other marginalized members of society. But then when we bring those conversations into the 21st century, it is as if we act like women's rights in Islam are frozen in the seventh century. It's whatever he said, that's it, and nothing beyond that. Anything outside of that, anything beyond what the Prophet said or did related to women is a bid'ah, an innovation of sorts. We interpret his work on slavery and the Quran's idea of slavery as slowly gradually abolishing slavery, that it couldn't abolish it overnight. And so it started with smaller, very, very significant steps at a time, like requiring Muslim to, Muslims to, to uh, free Muslims or free Muslims to, to treat enslaved people well, um, or freeing enslaved people uh, or feeding them in order to expiate for a sin, to make up for a particular sin or a particular wrong. 
but we don't apply that logic to women's rights or to the rights of LGBTQ Muslims and so on. Most of us don't think, oh, if the Quran gave women the right to choose their own spouses or allowed them to serve as witnesses in business related cases or to own property in their own names, et cetera, in a context where that was very, very weird and unheard of, then that was only the beginning. And its intention was to gradually lead to even more rights for women. Now, you've probably heard that we can't just change things that the scholars historically agreed on. They debated things and then they settled on a particular, they established, they established a particular opinion, settled on that opinion, and that's it. And you might have heard some of your own favorite Muslim scholars talking as though their hands are tied when it comes to what is acceptable and unacceptable. Your favorite scholars might personally want to support a particular position, a particular practice, but they tell you they can't because the scholars, the historical scholars, the past scholars said otherwise instead. But this is actually quite dishonest of them if this is what they're telling us. They have options. They have so many options to choose from. And if they're knowledgeable about the topic or about Islam in general, then they know about those options. And the fact that they're choosing to withhold information from us, those other options from us, from you, uh, from me, is something for us to think about, to reflect on why is that happening? Why are they not trusting us with the knowledge that they have that is relevant in that particular context for us? Because Islam affords us so many different possibilities to choose from many different opinions, scholarly opinions that we can choose from. And today in the 21st century, those opinions are even more diverse than they were in the past for very, for many different reasons. One, one of which is the, you know, knowledge is a lot more accessible to us online. Everybody is writing stuff online these days. So to the above question of what can change with time of, of, of what the Islamic, quote unquote, Islamic reasons are for changing an established practice or doctrine or scholarly opinion, this brings me to the question of picking and choosing from a wide array of opinions. I'm a huge fan of picking and choosing. I, I know that this concept has a negative reputation, a negative connotation, and I hear Muslims and, and people of other faiths also telling each other and telling other people that you can't just pick and choose, that you gotta pick, you gotta stick to one particular approach or one particular school uh, in, in the context of Islam that would be a madhab, an Islamic legal school or school of thought like the Hanafi or Shafi'i or Hanbali and so on. But this never made sense to me personally in the past. And now having studied this in depth, my one of my first chapter, well, the first chapter in my book is entirely on this question of tradition changing and um, picking and choosing. It also doesn't make sense to me now intellectually and academically because we're always picking and choosing. Everyone does it, but to different extents and for different reasons. In fact, I argue that if we were consistent in how we practiced Islam, in the, in the sources that we chose, that we, that we relied on heavily to be Muslim, to practice Islam, then Islam wouldn't be practical. It wouldn't be relevant to us anymore. Islam wouldn't have survived for as long as it has. Consistency was and is never the, the, the point. The point instead is having an, it is sticking basically a particular um, a frame of reference, and that frame of reference could be a particular root. Uh, my own approach is going to be ethics and compassion in it, as I'll highlight later on. We need different frames of reference, and and in in, in my opinion, justice, compassion, equality, love, those should be foremost among anything else. Now, my favorite part about this idea of picking and choosing is that the Islamic legal system and the Islamic tradition of the past 1400 years has terms for picking and choosing and encourages doing so. And not just for scholars only, for the ulama only, but for regular people like you and me also. And I'll get to some of those terms in just a bit, but for now, I wanna explain that when we pick and choose, what's actually happening is not so much the picking and choosing, but rather we're connecting the dots. We're making connections through a very careful, very deliberate, it's sometimes subconscious. We're not necessarily actively thinking about it or out loud thinking about, thinking about it, but, it, but we're careful nonetheless. And, and oftentimes it's a very creative engagement with this vast, diverse Islamic tradition of 1400 years. And I think we're very lucky to be able to pick and choose because it shows that we have different possibilities that exist, the, the a mercy from God, and that these possibilities are results of interpretive choices, right? Scholarly engagements and negotiations and renegotiations with the tradition. 
by interpretive choices, I mean that Muslim scholars in, in the past historically took the Quranic text and the hadiths and then, and then each other's interpretations and interpreted those asked what they meant. They came to different conclusions about the meanings and the applications of those texts. And if something didn't make sense to them, didn't feel right, even if it was explicitly stated a particular way in the text, they worked around it. They found some kind of a way to make sense of it or to, 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 to defend, to Islamically defend, to justify their interpretation, even if it was, it seemed very, very contrary to what the explicit text was stating. And we continue to do this. This is one of the ways that religions that that religions survive, but that traditions are still traditions that where we end up staying rooted in traditions. They disagreed on practically everything, and it's one of the reasons why we have so many different schools of thought. Their disagreements are it's one of the reasons that we have so many different schools of thought um, and different sects and and branches of Islam, of course. You see, the Muslims of of the Muslim scholars of the of the past fourteen hundred years developed a whole system that facilitated and still facilitates a multiplicity of opinions, a, a, a wide range, a diverse range of opinions on practically all issues that you can think of on all topics that are relevant by their time. So when I say you can think of, that was for their time. They obviously didn't think about a lot of the stuff that's only relevant to us today. They gave us words like tahayyur, which means selecting the best option of many, many possible ones, or picking and choosing the best, selecting the best option. Specifically, so they, they came up with this concept, this strategy, specifically to accommodate Muslims' realities. These past scholars, whether they were the mujtahids, uh, the folks engaging in ijtihad or independent reasoning or legal reasoning uh, or reinterpreting an established opinion, the fuqaha, the, the folks who were engaged in, 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 in pursuing fiqh, in conducting fiqh, Islamic jurisprudence, so Islamic legal scholars, and other kinds of scholars, other ulama, they didn't question the idea of legal pluralism, of Islamic pluralism, of the idea of various interpretations of a given issue. They came up with principles like encouraging scholars, encouraging each other and regular lay people to choose the least stringent of the available options. Muslim scholars have always departed from their predecessors uh, when they believed that it was necessary to do so. Like when their desired outcome was not being accommodated by existing opinions, they came up with new ones. And those new ones got added to the tradition. It's like a, it's like a bank, a, a bank of opinions that they could then choose from, that future ones could choose from. So I mentioned Islam has specific terms within it, specific strategies within it that accommodate change, flexibility um, in our practice and understandings of Islam. And I'm gonna now go through some of these terms. I won't go through all of them and definitely not in detail, um, and again, you can read about these in detail in my in my one of my chapters in the book, in the first chapter, I think, in the book. So some of these terms are tahayyur, like I just mentioned. Um, but then we have something called tarjih, and I'll go into details of what they mean. But tarjih is preponderance. Uh, we have the tabu ar uh, which literally means pursuing the dispensations. I'll explain in a bit what that means. We have ishtihad, uh, we have maslaha, we have darura, necessity. You might have even heard of good bid'a and 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 bad bid'a uh, as well. So tarjih is a it, again preponderance. It, preponderance. Um, it's determined by the strength of evidence or the number of authorities that support the number of scholars that supported a particular view. So you would evaluate a, a multiple opinions um, on a given issue. And then the opinion that has the strongest piece of evidence was the one that was chosen or established as the most correct option. It was There's no such thing as this is the only correct option or this is the final outcome. Muslim scholars don't have such a concept historically. But most importantly, tarjih was something that was available not just to regular to, to, to scholars, but also to regular people, to lay Muslims. So you and I could just could partake in that particular tradition as well. Because there were certain concepts, certain terms that were considered to be for the scholars only, um, and then there were others that anybody could engage in. Um, and that's not something that is a, a non-negotiable. So we can absolutely renegotiate that. But this was a term that was used used within primarily the same school. So you've got you would you would look at the existing opinions of scholars following the same school, like the Hanafis or the Shafi'i, and so on. Um, and then you would choose a, you would choose a particular opinion from within those scholars, and then that would be then you would have one that would be the Hanafi position or the Maliki position and so on. 
Um, arujas, the other term that I mentioned, one of the other terms that I mentioned, it literally means pursuing the dispensations. And what this means is you apply, we especially applied this historically to social issues uh, when social need when social needs uh, needed to be reinterpreted or, or or some kind of a change was needed because of a social need. But the term refers to carefully revisiting and reinterpreting a juristic or a, an Islamic legal opinion uh, that was most convenient. Uh, whether within the same legal school, like sticking to the Hanafi, for example, only or across the different schools. So you chose an opinion from a bunch of different schools, the one that was the most convenient. Because ease was really, really important. Convenience, the idea was to keep Islam relevant and practical and to not, as the Quran tells us, to not create hardships for ourselves. Islam is not intended to be to be a, a, a source of hardships for us. It is supposed to be, an, it, it is intended as an ease for us, the Quran tells us. Before the Islamic legal schools were developed, so because that took a, by again, Islamic legal schools, meaning the Hanafi, the Maliki, et cetera. Uh, and, and I'm talking, of course, only about the Sunni context here. But before those schools developed, because that took several centuries uh, to become what we know them as the Islamic legal system and the different schools. There were hundreds of them historically, and then four major ones for Sunni Islam survived uh, for reasons that scholars have discussed that I'm happy to go through in the Q&A. Um, but this the, this concept, the Tabba al uh, it meant choosing the least strict of any of the opinions available from anywhere, from any scholar. Um, and one important uh, note that I want to make about this particular term is that it's associated with the Quranic term Ittiba al hawa or following one's whims. And so some scholars didn't uh, use the, the, the term tatabu al ruchas um, and ittiba al hawa interchangeably. But then because of this, because it means to follow one's whims, or sorry, it doesn't mean to follow one's whims, it, it, it comes, it has it, it shares a root word uh with uh, to follow one's whims, it has a negative, it's historically had a negative connotation uh in Islam. And so scholars today and in the more modern periods, post 1800s, have preferred the term the khayyur instead, the one where you select from a, a bunch of different options and then you go with the best uh, possible option. Um, so we have here also, um, oh, um, and, and, and scholars from the 1800s onwards, have, we've been applying these strategies all throughout Muslim history, but especially in the 1800s onwards, modernity, uh, we've been relying on them to, you know, to initiate change to uh, as a source of uh, Islamic, as, as an Islamic source of change um, for to make, to especially make political changes to our societies, to our Muslim majority countries. Now, the Hanafi courts, um, in, in uh, very famously, the Hanafi courts of the Ottoman Empire, they commonly used all of these doctrines uh, from various different schools to accommodate women going through divorces. And so they applied these to, 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 to social issues, to gender issues, um, especially to women's rights, to be able to accommodate women and to give them more options and more, more protection. And scholars have written books about how uh, the different different courts, whether Hanafi or and so, but especially Hanafi courts, how they relied on many, many different other schools as well to come to a particular conclusion that was in the best interest of the individual at hand. Now we have another term like this uh, called talfiq, which literally means to sew two pieces of cloth together. So basically combining two options or doctrines. Now I've seen examples of this applied to gender issues and this is my area. So this is uh, that's why I, I keep referencing gender here. Um, but for example, you uh, say you're a Shafi'i Muslim woman trying to get married uh, without the permission or the knowledge or the support of your male guardian, without the involvement of a male guardian, and you don't have or don't want witnesses. Now, most Muslims think that we are required to have, the, a woman is required to have witnesses or for in order for a marriage to be valid. Uh, Islamically, you need to have witnesses and uh, you need to have a woman, uh, a male guardian for the, on the woman's behalf. That's not quite the case. It's, it's, there are Muslim scholars haven't really agreed on what makes a marriage uh, legally valid, Islamically valid. But what you would do in that situation is you would combine the Hanafi idea that a woman doesn't need a wali because uh, Hanafis do not require a wali or male guardian for a woman to get married. And Shafi'is do not require uh, witnesses for a valid marriage. And so you would combine the Hanafi idea and the Shafi'i idea and go ahead and do your marriage the way that you want it. And that is, that's one way to use talfiq. And uh, scholars have, again, written books where they give examples of marriage, a divorce, and so on to family um, to, to, to show us how Muslims have historic, lay people have used uh, these strategies as well. You might also be familiar with the, the term ijtihad, 
um, or the word maslaha, uh, which are very well known more commonly than the others. And especially in the past couple of centuries, because they have been used as motivations uh, motivations for um, an Islamic justifications for social change. So ijtihad is inherently rooted in reason, uh, it's sometimes defined as as legal reasoning or independent reasoning. It's also rooted in the word jihad in in the word to struggle. So it's similar to jihad in that um, it comes from the root word jihada or to struggle. So what are you struggling for? You're struggling. Uh, you, you're you're making an effort. You're struggling to arrive at a conclusion that would be most pleasing to God. So it is supposed to be sincere and so on. Ijtihad exists as a tool for Muslims, um, usually for scholars, for folks trained in. In Islamic sciences, so a mujtahid is, a, is somebody who does uh, ijtihad, but it's practically available to regular Muslims, to lay Muslims as well. Maslaha is often defined as public, as public good, as welfare, public interest, uh, and it's rooted in a desire for positive social change, so or the reduction of harm, um, or the genuine well-being of society. But we always have to ask ourselves, what does society mean? Uh, what does harm mean? What does it mean when we talk about a community? And I'll ask this question later again uh, towards the end. But it allows for it, it allows Muslims to change a practice or a teaching in the interest of a common collective good. So it's necessarily collective and it's necessarily good. Maslaha too uh, has been used for social change um, in, in, in Muslim history. Uh, the most common, one of the most common examples uh, being that of the abolition of slavery. So because historical Islamic tradition accepted slavery as, as a reality uh, and Islamic law takes it for, for granted, its practices for uh, its practice uh, for granted, modern scholars and scholars post 1800s argued that Islam today cannot accept slavery as, a mo as morally permissible because it has a harmful impact on society. And so that was one of the times that we used, um, that we especially used maslaha. And scholars today are, are redefining it and they're applying it to other contexts as well. Scholars of Islam and gender have been doing it for gender issues as well. Then we have the concept of darura. Uh, darura is literally means, it's a term that literally means necessity. So by this principle, anything is negotiable and anything and everything is subject to change out of necessity. It's very connected to the social uh, social norms issue. There has never been an agreement on what exactly constitutes necessity. So we and, and I'm I'm grateful for that. So we get to decide. Every generation gets to decide what needs to change or what 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 necessity means. Um, but they have uh, they have agreed unanimously. Muslim scholars have unanimously agreed historically that harm must be avoided at all costs, even if it meant breaking an Isla a particular Islamic rule. Uh, what they did not define again clearly was harm. Um, or necessity. And so today, many things that historical scholars, um, scholars of our past found acceptable can, I think, easily be considered harmful, including uh, some of our, uh, many of our opinions on women, uh, on LGBTQ plus people, um, on non-Muslims, relations between Muslims and non-Muslims, and so on. So we can redefine that depending on our particular context and time period. Um, ijma, you've probably, ijma is another term that I want to mention. You uh, might know it as literally as consensus, but generally it's understood as the majority view. But then as I discuss in my book and as other many scholars, as scholars have written books about this concept of ijma, it is very difficult to define, uh, to even define what majority means, because if you think about it, how could they historically have had access to everybody's opinion um, or every possible opinion? So it's difficult to define and to know with certainty um, the, the opinions of the majority of the scholars who have who, 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 that were historically present. And so it's been so scholars have been very flexible with applying ijma, and they recognize that as well that we don't have access to every single possible opinion. And, and not and I'll get into which opinions are considered valid to begin with because not all opinions are going to be an option for us to consider. Um, but I was listening to a lecture by Yasser Qadi recently, or a few a few years ago, uh, that I think it's it's still on YouTube, and I was listening to it for my book on on change and Islam, and he claims that as long as there's even one dissenting opinion on any issue in Islam, then there's no ijma on that topic. That there cannot be ijma on that topic. He believes that in order for consensus for ijma to be considered legitimate, to be valid Islamically then there must be absolutely no disagreement from any scholar, not even one scholar, 
um, there should be no challenges to this established position. But then he mentions that the, 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 he talks about female-led prayers in that talk, and he mentions that, or he claims that um, the ijma there is valid, but then he seems to, I, and this I'm, I'm pretty sure he it feels like he's withholding information from us, and this is why I think we need to be we need to be very um, critical of when when scholars are withholding information from us. But he claims that this ijma is completely valid because nobody has ever disagreed with the established position, he argues, that women cannot lead mixed gender prayers. But then there were several dissenting opinions, and not just from anybody, but from people like Ibn al-Arabi but and Tabari. Of all people, Tabari, is a, he's a major scholar of Islam, and he unconditionally supported women's right to lead mixed gender prayers. And so for and several there are several others as well. I have a whole chapter on female led prayers in my in my book. But the fact that Yasir Qadi is telling us that a, a ijma is valid um, only if there's no dissenting opinions, and then he tells us that this 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 ijma on female led prayers is valid, assuming there's an ijma on it, um, at least a, the collective opinion of all scholars. Um, but then the fact that there were several dissenting opinions, several several scholars who absolutely allowed unconditionally unequivocally allow female-led prayers of mixed gender congregation. Uh, and I refuse to believe that Yasir Qadi doesn't know that. So I, I, there's a lot of questions to be asked there. But continuing with our different, school, different tools, the different strategies that are available for change in Islam to us, we've also got something called Maqasid al-Sharia. And, and that's a branch of Islamic knowledge. It's concerned with uh, figuring out the, the purposes, the purpose of Islamic law, the principles of Islamic law, of Sharia. It's invested in trying to infer from, from divine sources the intent of God, because we can't know what God's intent is ever going to be, but we can try to figure it out. And that process is in Islam has always been more important than the outcome, than the final conclusion. These maqasid, these purposes, these principles include the preservation of life, the preservation of lineage, of health, of property, of religion, you might have heard of intellect, of honor, and there are the list goes on and on. But the typically the the five uh, the the five ones that are identified are religion, the preservation of religion, um, life, intellect, lineage, and property. It's subjective though. There's nothing in Islam that says that's the maqasid, that those are the maqasid of Sharia. Ah. Um, so it's very subjective. Uh, be, partly be, for a, a whole bunch of reasons, but if you notice, um, it identifies a lot of uh, some patriarchal interests as among those that are considered to be of divine intent, uh, like the preservation of male lineage. Uh, but I propose that we can apply the larger message of such an endeavor, of such an effort to an ethical understanding of Islam, because in the ways that they have been developed historically, and then we can apply those to our modern times. Ibn Ashur, one of uh, one of my personal favorite scholars of Islam, who a uh, Tunisian scholar, he died in 1973, so pretty recent. He argues, he adds equality to the list of maqasid. To, he, he talks about maqasid al sharia and he adds equality to his list because he argues that human equality is ensured in, the, in, in, in Islam. So we can keep on adding a whole bunch of things, a whole bunch of terms and concepts to these maqasid. The idea is that we have Scott, we have a whole system in place that try to figure out what the intent of God might be. There are other strategies I quickly mentioned. Uh, you may have heard of uh, a good bid'ah. This is a good bid'ah and this is a bad bid'ah. Uh, something like tarawih prayers, the, doing it collectively is, is scholars have considered that a, a, an example of good Bid'ah. It's a bid'ah in that we didn't. The Prophet ﷺ did not do it with people. We decided to go ahead and do it with people, uh, but that became an example of a of a good bid'ah. But my point is that when we read these different strategies collectively, I think that the message is very very clear. Change is integral and inherent to Islam, and Muslim scholars historically had the humility to recognize that, to honor that, to make room for us to make that happen. We can't know for sure what God's intent is. But we need to stay as ethically minded, as ethically grounded as possible at all times. And we need to have multiple opinions, multiple options available to us at any given time on any given issue so that we can make change happen and continue as leaders of change for the world. I truly believe in this. And I think that's what the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, was doing. So to me, one of the purposes of these conversations in, in Islam historically of this whole discussion of the different 
um, uh, strategies for change was to create ease and, and to accommodate uh, our individual in uh, conveniences, both individual and also collective conveniences, societies to, re to reduce harm. Um, as is obvious, I think, from the definitions of some of these terms, like literally choosing the least stringent of opinions. So I suggest that as new issues and new concerns arise, whichever past ideals no longer fit into our ethical conceptual system, um, then we need to we, we are fundamentally permitted to modify those to replace them with better, more suitable, less stringent ideas and opinions. One quick note about uh, about these tools, though, because I want us to I want to I want to I want us to receive this carefully. The use of these tools was always regulated in some way. It's not like all opinions were equally available to everybody. It's not like all opinions were even considered equally. All were not equally valid whatsoever. We didn't have access to all of the possible opinions to begin with. We today don't have access to all of the possible opinions. But some of the strategies, some of the strategies that you, uh, it, and some of the strategies that um, that these scholars only used them after another one didn't work out. So it's not like all of them you could just use at any given time. There was still a preference for this one should there was a hierarchy basically. But which opinions were valid and invalid was always and continues to be a matter of debate. And so that's not settled. So any opinion we need to be we need to be thoughtful of it and consider it as an option. And then if we decide that it, we, we can reject it, if it's not valid, if it doesn't work for whatever reasons, then that's a different story. But my point is that the legal, the Islamic legal system, that Islamic law, that Islam at 1400 years of Islam has often made attempts to ensure that what it perceives to be the best possible meaning or, or the best possible interpretation of anything, one, that scholars really, really tried very hard um, to and sometimes not successfully in my opinion, but they tried very hard to, to get us to the best possible conclusion. And while I don't have the time to go into all of the technical details of how we can have all of the all, all, how we can have all of this uh, permission for picking and choosing, while simultaneously having a very organized system in place, my, my book covers some of this in detail, explaining um, precisely why it is that we can have both tremendous diversity, and also unity in a sense with a in a sense of rootedness in Islam and even in an Islamic tradition. So I don't have time to go into the specific details of that, but I in my book I propose a particular model, a particular way, approach of think to thinking about how it is that we can pick and choose but still maintain um, a very close uh, tie and, and a root to stay rooted in our tradition. The point that I want to make that I'm making is that a system has already been put in place that, that we as contemporary Muslims can draw from, can, that we can draw on to accommodate our evolving needs. There's no valid reason to associate the Islamic tradition exclusively with its past, uh, with the scholars, with the opinions of the scholars of the past, or with its patriarchal renditions. There are many patriarchal practices that the scholars of the past completely endorsed and thought were the only way, the, the, the best possible thing that we today are like, no, that's not an acceptable way of living anymore. So the opinions that were av available to us in the past should be considered alongside the new ones that we're offering today, that are being offered today. And, and today, thereby Muslims of, of many, many different walks of life, um, Muslims with different experiences, uh, different interpretations, different interests. Um, and so they're offering new stuff. Think, think for example, about uh, LGBTQ plus folks or, 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 or converts who are entering the religion and they have different experiences or poor people or disabled people. And of course, Muslim women who have been uh, Muslim feminists, we've been contributing to the state of Islam for, for, for generations also, or Muslims who are hurting who are suffering sometimes because of a specific interpretations of his, uh, a very particular, very limited interpretation of Islam. And so when we when we add their experiences, their knowledge uh, into this whole, in, into the system that we have that is available to us, into this bank of opinions, um, then I think we, 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 we end up with an even more richer possibility. We have so many, it's a tremendous uh, richness in the tradition, and then it's an ongoing tradition. It's it's an evolving tradition, and so we have those ones to consider as well. And this is why I think we shouldn't trust any scholar who acts like their hands are tied, uh, that they can't change anything, that they can't change something in in Islam or in their communities. That they have to do that they have to do exactly what the previous scholars said they should do or came up with. 
Um, I've heard I've heard some even say that you can't just change Islam because of your own whims. But something to consider here is that there were scholars, there were some scholars who literally had no problem saying they have evidence to the contrary, but they'll say something like, I know this is the case, but I prefer X, Y, Z instead, right? And their preferences became the law for people, for not themselves, but for other people who are being affected by their positions, by their opinions. They had evidence, for example, that Aisha, the Prophet Muhammad's wife, led women in other women in prayer, but some of them still said, they still concluded, and, and they're talking about this hadith, but then they'll say, I know this is the case, but I prefer that women not lead anybody in prayer at all. I prefer that women do X, Y, Z instead. So it's their opinions, not some Islamic, some Quranic, some guidelines from the Sunnah that became the source of, of, of a particular practice um, or that, you know, that, that led to our resistance to changing, to allowing women to uh, to become religious leaders or or to, you know, to even to become witnesses, right? They, they had evidence in the Quran that women can, can serve as witnesses for financial cases, in, uh, no, no less business issues, no less. Uh, but they decided, well, this is an exception. God only allows it in this context. In other contexts, women can't be. That, that was one opinion. Not all, not all scholars uh, agreed with that. The point being their personal opinions and often really, oftentimes really problematic opinions uh, became this uh, became a source of, of, of law. They were, their opinions, their personal opinions became the source of law for a Muslim. And it was their opinions that uh, led to the idea that attractive women shouldn't attend mosques. So that's just one example because I just edited the part of, in my book where I was dealing with that uh, with that chapter. That's in the I discuss that in detail in one of my chapters in the book. So the point is, individual men's opinions and wishes did become an actual law or actual laws for Muslim women, and those men did not have to deal with the impact of those particular law of their own opinions. Someone else, other people, the rest of us, oftentimes marginalized people, had to deal with the impacts of their opinions. And that's been happening for 1400 years. So pay attention to what, what they actually mean when they say Islam isn't about your personal whims. Islam isn't about your personal opinions. My own personal approach to change and the negotiables and the non-negotiables of Islam is, as I mentioned already, is rooted in what I understand to be ethics. So, and mercy and compassion, God's compassion in particular. For me, if it's not ethical, then it's simply not Islamic. I cannot think of anything that is unethical that I can say is also Islamically, but that, that is unethical, but is Islamically acceptable. Even if it is the majority um, of opinion, of, of a scholarly opinion, even if the majority of the past scholars agreed on something, determined it to be Islamically acceptable, if it is unethical, I'm going to reject, reject it as an Islamic uh, thing. If it harms people, if it harms society, if it harms a specific group within our society, then it's not Islamic. If it has been deemed Islamic all this time for the past 1400 years, we have good reasons to change it using the tools and the strategies that I mentioned are available to us. We also have to start asking more questions like, what do we mean by harm? What do we mean by society? When we say if it harms a particular members of society or particular groups of a society, how are we defining the word society? Who does something have to be harmed by? Who does something, who does who has to be harmed by a particular practice, right? Which group of groups of people have to be harmed by a particular practice for it to be reconsidered and renegotiated. So like my respondent th that I mentioned earlier uh, from my research whom I just quoted, I'm not convinced that changing social norms is a good enough motivation for change for any kind of change in Islam. Part of the reason is because of what she said, right? How does it look? What does it mean? What does it say that we're looking around us to see who has changed something already? Before we jump to the before we jump on the bandwagon wagon and say, yeah, okay, that's that's not acceptable anymore. So we we shouldn't we shouldn't do this anymore. We're not leaders of uh, we're not the leaders of change anymore. We're not initiating the change anymore. But part of it is also that there's a disturbing pattern, a disturb and, and some some to an extent a trend also. But there's a disturbing pattern in what we're thinking of as social context. Right? We impose limits on this social context and and on the social norms argument. As I mentioned, uh, think about I mean have think about something like I keep talking about female led prayers or uh, mixed gender prayers or LGBTQ issues. Have social have social norms not globally changed such that women are leaders and we are visible in pretty much all areas of life, and we even enjoy positions of religious leadership, of religious authority, 
um, including leadership and worship in many, many communities worldwide. Why then are Muslims globally so hesitant, so reluctant to allow women to even recite the call to prayer, the adhan, let alone be leaders of prayers? Have social norms not changed when it comes to sexuality and sexual orientations? Why then are we, or many Muslims, so opposed to the idea, so resistant to the idea of the validity of same-sex relations? Of course, to be fair, uh, many other religious communities are struggling with these issues as well, uh, namely, especially Christianity, which is still debating the same issue with women and leadership uh, in leadership position. But you get the idea. Do we have to wait for Christians and Jews and everybody else to change their, their collective opinions before we too can say, okay, you're right, let's start allowing women to do X, Y, and Z. So I want us to really understand why we resist change when we're resisting change. Is it really about Islam? Or is there some ego involved perhaps? Is our resistance ethically grounded? Is it rooted in compassion? Is it rooted in, what is, what is the root of our resistance? And are we really staying true to God, to Islam, when we resist change for whatever reasons? When we say a change in social norms is acceptable, is an acceptable reason for changing something in Islam, then as I mentioned earlier, let's begin asking ourselves what we mean by social norms. Whose social norms? For whom? When we say if something has a harmful impact on society, what do we mean by society? Are we including the most marginalized members of our society in this definition? And I think these questions can really help us better understand ourselves, our relationship with Islam and God, and uh, definitely our relationship with change. So as we close now, for those of for those who are listening, uh, we'll do this. For those of you who are, who are present right now, we'll do this um, in, in, in breakout rooms in just a bit. But for those of you who are listening um, outside of this Zoom session, I want you to think about three questions that I'm going to encourage you to take home with you. The first one is, what do you think about or how do you feel about the fact that Islam doesn't seem to have a problem with picking and choosing or this, this concept of picking and choosing or cherry picking? Um, and that we have so many options, so many resources available to us that we can choose from to choose a, an opinion that we that we like best. What kind of emotions uh, and feelings does this fact evoke in you? I think that your reaction, your own your reaction to this uh, to, to 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 this particular fact uh, can tell you a lot about your yourself, about your relationship with God, um, and your relationship really with your own self as well. The second question is, has there ever been a time or, or think about the times uh, when you had to pick and choose from multiple Islamic opinions and you went for the opinion that suited your personal desire best, your personal preference best? We've all been in that position. Uh, so don't be ashamed to admit it to yourself and to think about why, what that says now to you about change and Islam and so on. And the third question is, what are your own negotiables and non-negotiables in Islam? How did you determine them? Uh, meaning, what do you think? What is what is what is something that, in your opinion, is open to change in Islam, and what is something that is absolutely not to be touched? It's, it's not open to, to change in Islam at all. Thank you so much for your time, and uh, that's all. Assalamualaikum.